for joining us on Cincy Lifestyle this weekend. You know, we've had a lot of great people on the show this week, and we wanted to highlight just a couple of them in case you missed it during our live show. So take a look. I use a grouting tool. <laughs> Wow, you don't mess around. No, because we make so many of them, it goes much faster with the grouting tool, and it's nice because it's it's rubber and you can throw it in the dishwasher. We're talking about making her tamales with Jen's hot tamale food truck. On any given week, Jen can be making dozens and dozens of tamales, along with other Latin and Peruvian style street eats. I do all sorts of things. I do Mexican sandwiches, you know, called tortas. I do um, tacos. I do a sandwich called pan, chicha, pan con chincharron, which is a Peruvian pork sandwich with sweet potato and Peruvian salsa. And then we also do street corn, um, the elotes. And then we also do uh, something called papas al huancaina, which is a Peruvian potato salad. And getting down to the basics, a tamale is like an all-natural, pre-packaged, moist corn muffin stuffed with either meats, veggies, or whatever sparks one's fancy. Um, I think the first thing that makes a good tamale is the batter. Yeah. So the batter has to be, um, it has to be moist, and it has to be really light. And the filling, it's all about the way you cook it and the sauce. So this is our batter, which I made already, and you can make it easily in a mixer. I use a paddle, you can use a whisk. Um, the key to a good batter is to make sure when your batter, you think your batter is ready, put a little bit of it in some cold water and make sure it floats. If it floats, you're good to go. I do a lot of uh, research to old recipes, new recipes, and I play, play around with them a lot. And I, I really try to go for that authentic flavor and authentic, like a, a balance between everything. Yeah. You know, so it's not just, you know, all the meats are slightly sweet. No, I, you know, everything tastes different. And I, I try to achieve that balance between, you know, that saltiness and that nice sort of fat that you get from the meats and some of the meats, the way you have to cook them, the way you have to render them, you know, and then always, you know, citrus, you know, that nice sort of acid frame um, around the food so that it, you get this nice balance and then a little bit of spice. All right, here we go. Wow. That is really light. Yeah. And that is really flavorful. Yeah. Oh my God. I could eat like 12 of these. <laughs> Oh God, it's the food and it's fun. I mean, it's hard work, right? It's not really glamorous, <laughs> but it's, it's, that, it's that good hard work, you know, where you're just exhausted and you're like, okay, let's go back at it, you know? <laughs> and Allie is joining us right now. Allie, you're not supposed to talk with your mouth full, but it sure <laughs> looked good. <laughs> They were so good. Honestly, I was not joking when I said I could eat 12 of those. Um, I definitely I've been to had lunch with you, Allie, and I know you're not joking. <laughs> the extra sides of cheese, the extra sides of tamale, it's okay. And the options that she gave were really awesome. I, two thumbs up, truly, truly. Well, how, how'd she get her start? Yeah, good question. So she has an uh, interesting background in the sense that she's not originally from here, but the flavors in which that she was inspired by, she's from Chicago. So when you think of Chicago, um, there is a heavy Latino presence there, and they do a lot of the tamale food trucks and um, just mixing and matching with different spices in that world and dealing with and, and working in kitchens and just getting to know uh, the food there in Chicago. And believe it or not, when she added the Peruvian um, items to her menu, she was an archeologist in Peru for quite some time. So that's kind of where she found those two collaborative flavors and uh, culinary experiences. And then she ended up moving out to Cincinnati for a job that didn't work out. And she says, hey, you know what? The cost of living is cheap. Why don't I start my own tamale business? Because she, because of her experience in Chicago and her inspiration that she received in Peru. So she started out as a pop-up uh, market in 2016 and it was doing well. And she decided, you know what? I'm gonna start a food truck in 2019. And here we are. Okay, so Allie, first of all, you and I need to go there for lunch. You'll have to come yes. get me and take me. But, but other people will also want to go. So how can people see where her food truck will be parked in the future? Yes, yes. First and foremost, check her out on her Instagram and her Facebook. That's the best way to find out. 
Um, you can also book her and just message her directly. She does a lot of those HOA um, setups within neighborhoods or communities. You know, there are going to be more food truck events coming up. For example, in May, there's going to be one in Loveland. She's hoping that she could spend some time there. Um, but just keeping an eye out on social media is the best way to find her. All right, Ali, you know, she has a good variety. Did you have a quick favorite? I really like that you the want to try. All, well, all of them. I will eat and try anything, Mona, at least once. So the chicken <laughs> one was definitely my favorite. I, she makes all of the salsas herself as well. Mm. And you had the medium, the mild, and the really, really spicy one. And that's the one that, you know, apply at your own risk and don't touch your eyes afterwards. <laughs> but it oh, still wow. was really good. <laughs> So I would I would try them all if I could. They were genuinely really, really light and really flavorful. And, um, you know, it's tough to find a good tamale in Cincinnati. So I highly recommend checking it out. All okay. right. Allie, great job as always. Thank you. Someplace new to go eat, right, Clyde? Always. Cincy Lifestyle, we'll be right back. <laughs> I never thought I was going to be a rock star or, or anything like that. I never had that goal, and and I don't know that any rock star who's successful does. It's just I really enjoyed playing, and and it was a outlet for me to uh, just as a hobby have fun. Fast forward to today, Kyle's a bit of a rock star and a mastermind in his own right because he's built KSR amps from the ground up, combining his background in engineering with his passion for guitar playing. He designs and engineers every guitar amp, switch system, and mod, and will test each product after production, which is made possible because KSR Amps controls every step of production in-house and fosters an environment of innovation. At the end of the day, it's a tool that, that a musician is using to, to create, and I just try to add things to that, to make that tool more useful, more versatile, and perform well and be reliable. The innovation comes from, I think, packaging, features, sound, like some stuff I did to this guy, like this control, people are freaking out about this negative feedback control. It's just a knob that controls negative feedback. It's no big deal, right? Yeah. But that to a player is something really powerful. And powerful enough for bands like Killswitch Engage, along with guitarists Devin Townsend and Joe Satriani to invest. And it's not just the musicians who are invested in KSR amps. When I first came here to paint, I didn't know what this shop was. And I asked him, like, well, what do you, what do you even do here? And when he told me, I was just like, wow, that's really awesome. So I was immediately interested and joked around immediately, like, I'll probably end up working here. <laughs> and then here I am. And like many jobs, it's the culture and team dynamic that makes it worth waking up in the morning. So. The best way to describe the KSR team would be productive, practical jokers. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Corey, um, Corey is is legendary uh, around here for <laughs> playing random songs on the Alexas. Personally, I really love the products here, and I believe in the products, which is why I'm here. Um, I think it's it's the team and the element that we all bring to the table is why people enjoy it so much, why people want to be a part of it. It's a really well known, really well known company. Our our internet presence, uh, people see us, and they just really want to be a part of it. They're always talking about, I want to stop by, or I want to. Where do I apply? Is the main thing that we get on uh, on our social media. And at the end of the day, there's still that one underlying theme that brings each and every KSR AMP enthusiast together. And that's simply the love of music. If you're looking to get a breakfast treat with a new and different twist, then you'll need to check out a craft donut maker in Findlay Kitchen. She's taking unconventional flavors and turning them into delicious pillows of delight. So let's check in now with Karina Rice, the owner of Gad About Donuts. Karina, thank you for joining us this morning. My pleasure. So, so what made you want to open a donut shop and, and where did the name come from? Certainly. So the name comes um, actually from my great grandma's journals. Um, she would talk about gadding around town. Um, 
gadabouting around town. And that actually just means going around town to different social activities. And we started out um, as a pop-up shop going around to different coffee shops and breweries in the Cincinnati area. And um, so that's where the name came from. We felt like it was a perfect fit. And we got into donuts because one of the amazing things about donuts is that just in donuts, you can do so many different flavors and there are so many different styles of donuts. So it's kind of one thing, but there are so many things within the one thing and the opportunities for creativity just abound. Yeah, I was noticing that on some of your social posts, such unconventional flavors as grapefruit, peppermint, yes. and a wine, uh, let's see, a wine poached pear fritter. So talk about how yes. some of those came about and, and uh, how they came about. Certainly. So um, one of the ways that I find a lot of inspiration is to follow just lots and lots of different food accounts, um, particularly on Instagram, different mm -hmm. bakeries, donut shops, um, but also just like different cooking sites and see what flavors are popular, um, see what's trending and then figure out how we can put our own twist on things that might be kind of normal, like pears aren't unnormal, but to put them in a fritter and to poach them in wine. Um, and do that as a fritter is just something that you don't really see every day and it's extra delicious and um, it's a lot of fun <laughs> to find such uh, neat ways to put different flavors into donuts. Oh, I'll bet. So can you tell us about something that we might be able to look forward to on your menu? Certainly. So right now our flavor of the month is a hibiscus lime donut. So it's a brioche mm. dough and then it's got this bright floral um, hibiscus glaze and then in the center we have a sweetened mascarpone lime. It's kind of like a heart um, in the center there. And it's, oh, it's so delicious. And then next weekend, we'll also have um, a special with, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, baseball donuts <laughs> <laughs> since opening day is coming up. Yep. And we'll have uh, our favorite apple fritters as well. So if people want mm -hmm. to learn more or perhaps stop by, how can they connect with you? Certainly, so Instagram is where we're the most active. Um, you can always see what our menu is and what our current weekly specials are. And then we are doing pre-orders right now due to the current state of things. And so you mm -hmm. can pre-order Monday through Friday. And then pickup is on Saturday morning at Finley Kitchen. And there's a link in our Instagram bio or it's just gadaboutdonuts.com. So excited about, the, uh, about what you do, Karina. Thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Thank you. Well, our next guests know firsthand that parenting is a hard job. They're the comedic duo behind the social media account called I Mom So Hard. And now they've come out with a children's book. And right now I want to welcome Kristen Hensley and Jen Smedley, the authors of the book, The Meanest of Meanies. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining us. And I've got to ask, what made you decide to write a children's book? Well, we weren't going to write a novel at this point. We're too <laughs> tired as moms, especially after the last year. But we wanted to write something that both kids and their parents could enjoy reading. So I think The Meanest of Meanies, a book about love, kind of does that. It sneaks in a little lesson, but it's funny for everybody. So you know what? A lot of the, your followers on Instagram say they love it because it's so real. And you've got this, let's be real attitude. So talk about why that's important to you. I think we always tried to approach um, using social media as a as an opportunity to be very honest about the experiences we're going through because we have found the more specific we are, the more honest we are, the more it relates to everybody. And I think that's just our effort to make everybody feel like they're not alone in this mom game. And your very worst day, somebody's had exactly the same day. And like, we all wake up with the best of intentions and sometimes we go to bed in tears, but we, we are all in this together. And we just wanted to make moms feel very seen and very understood because we needed it for ourselves. You know, you're absolutely right. A lot of moms think I'm the worst mom in the world because some things happen. They lose their kid or something, you know, a kid gets trapped in an elevator, but you know, you are so <laughs> real about it. And, and there, you know, lots of moms are, are going through that same thing. So this is something really cool. The same Disney animator who did movies like Raya the Last Dragon illustrated your book. That is so cool. What was it like working with him? Well, first of all, it was the power of like the mom mafia because um, it was a friend of a friend and his and Paul's wife is a fan of my mom so hard. So 
it, we, this was a coup it for us a in a of million moms years. <laughs> yeah. In a million years, we never thought this would happen, but luckily we got the opportunity to work with him. And what he did that was so special is he really listened to what we wanted to, to try to convey. And then we worked really well together, just saying like, can we make the brush of the hair look like it's pulling even longer? Cause that mom's like walking behind her and he would do it. And he just brought this perspective of warmth and, and, and joy and, it could not have been a better experience. He he brought this book to life. Well, you know, this is great. It looks beautiful. So what do you hope moms and kids take away from the book? Well, the messages that we've gotten from moms so far, which have been so fun so for us sweet. to get, have um, kind of nailed what we wanted to have happen, which is uh, they get to spend some time reading a book that makes their kids laugh. There's all kinds of little jokes about toots and stuff like that in there. And then there's all these uh, sort of higher higher level uh, understanding for the parents. Yeah, like a tongue in cheek to the mom saying like, hey, we see you, we know you're trying to raise a civilized human and that kid just thinks you're mean. Yeah. But then at the end, of course, it be, is a love story. Yeah, we hope that she kind of like closes the book at the end of the night and is like, yep, yeah, okay, I'm doing okay. And the kid's like, I see what you did there. You taught me something. You taught me something and I don't know if I like it. <laughs> I have no doubt that moms and kids are going to enjoy this book, probably dads as well. So how can people find Meanest of Meanies? That's the right. Meanest of Meanies. It's available. You can get it at your local bookseller. Go to your small bookseller, and you can also find it online or wherever books Any are sold. retailers where books are sold. So kind of everywhere. <laughs> okay. That's great. Call Meanest us. Have... of Meanies. We've got it. Meanest of Meanies sounds like a great book. Jen Kristen. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Now, don't forget, you can always connect with Cincy Lifestyle on social media. We post all our guest segments and community stories on our Facebook page. We've got behind the scenes pictures on our Instagram. So be sure to like, follow, and subscribe. And we'll be right back. The regularly scheduled 8 p.m. train on the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad left Cincinnati bound for St. Louis on May 5, 1865. There were four passenger coaches, a baggage car, and an Adams Express Company car carrying cargo and freight. More than 100 passengers were on board. Just 17 miles from Cincinnati near the village of North Bend, the conductor, Mr. Shepard, saw that the rail lines up ahead had been destroyed. But the train was moving too fast. He could not stop the locomotive before a catastrophe. As the train derailed, the engine, baggage, and Adam's car flipped onto their sides, badly damaged. The passenger cars plowed into the mess, but stayed upright. The poor travelers, shaken from the horrifying crash, had no idea what lay in store. Almost immediately, they heard shouts, quote, don't move or you'll have your brains blown out, close quotes, followed by a volley of gunshots. Two armed men entered each car with two more outside guarding the perimeter. One newspaper reported, quote, while everything was wild with confusion, the desperados entered and with vilest oaths demanded the money and valuables of the passengers, close quote. A soldier returning from the Civil War had $300 stolen. Another man lost his gold watch and $500 in cash. While the terrified passengers were busy handing over their valuables, the real target of the attack was the Adams Company car. Using an axe, five bandits dragged three safes out into the open and used gunpowder to blow off their doors. Inside, they discovered $30,000 in bonds worth about $7 million today. All told, there were about 20 bandits involved in the Great Train Robbery, the first train robbery in American history. Almost as quickly as they pulled off the attack, the robbers slipped onto skiffs and made their way across the Ohio River and into Kentucky. In the Bluegrass State, they stole several horses and headed into the central part of the Commonwealth. Because of the precision and planning that it took to pull off the attack, investigators speculated that the bandits may have been angry Confederate guerrilla soldiers who did not accept the South's recent surrender only a month earlier. They were armed with Navy revolvers, which lent to the hypothesis, as did their retreat into the Kentucky hinterland. Although they were all dressed in civilian clothing, passengers heard one bandit addressed as lieutenant and another as captain. 
Well, as soon as the authorities heard of the great train robbery, militia and cavalry units were dispatched from Cincinnati, Covington, and Louisville. The men were never captured, which led many people to speculate that it wasn't the work of guerrillas, but instead soon-to-be legendary outlaws such as Jesse and Frank James or the Reno Gang. The Reno Gang later became infamous for committing a string of train robberies across the Midwest through 1868. Although hundreds searched for the gang, it was as if they had vanished into thin air. And appearing right now before your very eyes is the man who unearths these dark mysteries, cultural historian Bob Batchelor. Bob, thanks so much for talking to us this morning. Thanks, Clyde. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, ramifications, if you will, of this first train robbery. What happened because of this? Well, amazingly, you would think these dastardly deeds would go down in the the annals of history as something bad, but absolutely the opposite happened. People romanticize train robbery. And so for a hundred years, we have movies and films, and then later television shows, everything from the first blockbuster, The Great Train Robbery in 1903, through um, Bonnie and Clyde stories and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, everybody loves these stories. And so I started to think, are there still train robberies today? And it's an unbelievable number. $30 billion is still stolen through cargo wow. and freight to this day. So we don't romanticize it, but it's still a heck of a story and, and a big problem for law enforcement. And, and I'm guessing those robberies don't look exactly like the ones that we, that we traditionally think of. Yeah, I don't think you and I are going to go out and get on any horses with uh, pistols anytime soon, Clyde. No, I, I know that for sure for, in my case. So let's talk about North Bend for a moment, because that seems to be a community with a lot of history attached to it. So what else can you tell us about the village? Yeah, can you imagine this little small town, this first train robbery in American history, but it's also was founded by a guy named Sims, who was a Revolutionary War hero and land speculator. He was uh, the father-in-law of William Henry Harrison, the, the famous president who only lived for 41 days in office, maybe most famous for Tippecanoe and Tyler too, hmm. but then also the grandson of Benjamin Harrison. So this little town is the birthplace of two presidents and local history buffs can see all kinds of, of Harrison history and in Miami University, which Harrison, uh, Benjamin Harrison graduated from. So there's a lot of local history. When it's safe to travel again, North Bend would be a really interesting little place to check out. All right, that's great, that's great. Bob, thanks so much. We appreciate you stopping by this morning. Have a great day, Clyde. Thank you, sir, you too. Thanks for joining us for a special edition of Cincy Lifestyle. And remember, you can always check us out on weekdays at 10 a.m. on WCPO 9. And as always, make it a great day.